Well, we are so fortunate to have our next uh, speaker with us. Secretary Alexander Acosta was appointed by President Trump in February of 2017. He is a graduate of Harvard University and the Harvard, Harvard uh, College of Law. More to the point, he is a huge um, advocate for all workforce programs with a focus on apprenticeships, and we appreciate his um, unwavering uh, support to fill the skills gap in the United States. So please join me in giving a warm Iowa welcome to Secretary Acosta. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let, let me just say you're all so lucky to have Governor Reynolds. Uh, she is a leader on workforce issues. Uh, I, I got here a little bit early and was listening to the panel, and I was struck by the who's who of governors that are here talking about workforce issues. Uh, Governor Hutchinson, Governor Hickenlooper. Um, every conference that, that I go to in Washington, every major conference, whether it's the governor's associations, whether it's at the White House, um, they're all there. And now she brought them here to Iowa, and it's really a testament to, to what is happening in this state. You know, I um, so Governor, I um, uh, I was a little worried this weekend because I uh, I opened up uh, one of the East Coast papers, and the headline is Iowa's job crisis, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? I'm about to to go out and visit, and um, and then the head, the the subtitle was too many jobs, not enough people, and that's a real testament when you have a state with an unemployment rate just a little over three percent. And the job crisis is too many jobs, not enough people. That is a great problem to have. And so thank you for everything you're doing here. You know, an economic environment capable of generating growth and opportunity requires job readiness. And that is why Future Ready Iowa is so timely and important. So the message I wanted to bring here today to Iowa is that Washington is very focused on what you're doing. And here is how we're going to help. We're going to get out of your way. And that's a very important message. And I want to talk about how we're going to do that in several areas, on regulations, on occupational licensing, on education, and in helping individuals um, that are in crisis reintegrate into the workforce. Because our view is that empowering governors, like your governor, like Governor Hutchinson, like Governor Hickenlooper, to solve the problems of their state in partnership with the individuals of their state is the best way to create family-sustaining jobs. And so first, let me start with something I would hope all of you want to hear, and that has to do with WIOA. We believe that workforce decisions should reflect local variation and should not be made in Washington. And so the president's budget has called on Congress last year and calls on Congress again to provide the Department of Labor expanded authority to give waivers so that states can have more flexibility in how they spend WIOA money. Iowa is different than California and is different than my home state of Florida. And so as you spend the money, there should be discretion at the local level to reallocate those monies in a way that makes sense to Iowans and for Iowa. Very important. Second, we're committed to offering greater flexibility to the states, but we ask that the states look at internal flexibility in return. We want to inspire conversations on an issue that really is and has to be a state issue, and that's the issue of occupational licensing. There was a time not too long ago that less than one in 20 Americans needed a license to do something very fundamental, to work. Well, today, more than one in four Americans, almost one in three Americans, need a license before they can simply work. Excessive licensing profoundly hurts America and Americans. A Federal Reserve visiting scholar estimated that occupational licensing costs our economy 1.6 million jobs each year. That's 1.3% of our total employment rate. Now, sometimes 
Washington talks about 1.6 million jobs, and it's hard to translate that. Imagine a 1.3 million change in our unemployment, I'm sorry, 1.3% change in our unemployment rate. That is the cost of excessive licensing. Now, that was a Federal Reserve study. Brookings said that's wrong. It's not 1.6 million, it's not 1.3%, but it's actually 3 million, nearly double the cost in jobs because of occupational licensing. And here's a difficult part. It hurts the most those who can afford the least. So among friends, sometimes discussions are honest. So I asked my staff to look up some licenses here in Iowa. There's a license for individuals that install something very simple in the home, something that many of you might install yourselves, that costs $1,200 here in Iowa. Can individuals that are starting out afford $1,200 plus the cost of courses to get licensed? Does that affect those who can afford the least the most? Absolutely. And I have to say, in this one industry, by contrast, South Dakota, Wisconsin, and Missouri charge zero because they don't license it. Now, the truth is that every state has these stories. And in every state that I go, I can find examples. Excessive license places a heavy barrier as well on individuals that are serving the military. Every time they're reassigned, his or her spouse faces a difficult decision to break up the family unit or to give up a career. And so I've sat at a table with military spouses or teachers who can't teach, with military spouses who are medical professionals who can't practice, with medical spouses who are dietitians, I'm sorry, military spouses who are dietitians, who have to give up their careers as they move with the military serviceman or woman. Every two years, we're just talking about the need to have great teachers and great medical professionals. It's wrong to not recognize other states' licenses. And so if they're unnecessary, limit them. If they're necessary for health and safety, streamline them. And if you can honor other states' licenses, please do so. I also want to talk a little bit about educational flexibility. Nationally, there's 6.3 million open jobs. I was speaking with the lieutenant governor a few minutes ago, and he pointed out that in Iowa, there's 65,000 open jobs today. 65,000. And you know, we tell young Americans that college will lead to marketable skills and that failure to complete college is sometimes akin to failure. And neither is entirely true, and both are somewhat misleading. And it's a message that we need to stop telling young Americans. Too many college graduates leave college without marketable skills, and many individuals that don't go to college find success and find family-sustaining jobs. The goal really should be to empower young Americans to pursue jobs that make sense for them and to stop this message of this is the right thing for everyone and if you don't do it, you should feel bad about yourself because you shouldn't. And so earlier today, I was at the Ottawa, uh, Atomwa, sorry, the Atomwa Job Corps Center and I met some young students that were doing fabulous work. And several of them said that they had been homeless and they had been sent by their shelter to the Job Corps Center. And some of them had been referred there by foster parents. And they talked about their career options. And they were excited about what they were learning and they were excited about what they were doing. And then they're gonna be going to Indian Hills Community College. And Indian Hills has a great partnership program with that Job Corps Center. And one of the students that recently graduated from that is now making $80,000 a year. So I want someone to tell that student that that is not success. Because for that student, that is success. And I have to say that the governors, as they were talking about it, are absolutely right. We've spent too much time telling individuals that there's only one plan A and that everyone needs to pursue that. And college is right for many, 
But for many, a family-sustaining job can be found through other mechanisms. We need more flexibility. So something that we're looking at is expanding the Pell program. You know, colleges like Indian Hills have many certificate programs. And in the healthcare industry, for example, you can have stackable credentials. Before you get an associate's degree, you can get a credential, a certificate, that lets you enter the healthcare field and have a job. And then you can go back and get a second level and go back and get a third level. And there is no reason that programs like Pell should not sustain certificate programs. Again, we're sending horrible signals by saying, it's completely true, we're sending a horrible signal by saying that federal financial aid is available for degree programs, but not for certificate programs under 600 hours. So we've asked Congress to expand the Pell program and make the Pell program available to certificate programs in community colleges. I also want to talk a little bit about apprenticeship programs. You know, Iowa is one of the nation's leaders in apprenticeship programs. Iowa does a great job in apprenticeship programs and places like Indian Hills and the Job Corps Center and others around Iowa um, really, really sort of set a very, very high bar for other states to follow. But we also want to expand apprenticeship programs in important ways. First, we want to provide alternative mechanisms to offer apprenticeship programs. So currently, we have a registered apprenticeship program where companies register with the Department of Labor and with state and local workforce boards to offer that. But some companies may choose not to register, and they still want to participate in apprenticeship programs. So we're setting up a second vehicle called an industry-recognized apprenticeship, where industry can choose to offer apprenticeship programs. They don't have to register with the Department of Labor. Industry itself would become the sponsor of those apprenticeship programs. So the Department of Labor will empower trade associations across the country or labor management organizations or labor unions or others to offer high quality apprenticeship programs. Here's the difference. Registered apprenticeship programs by operation of law have access to WIOA dollars. Industry recognized apprenticeship programs do not have access to that by operation of law, but will have much more flexibility. And again, here is the vision behind this. We want to provide maximum flexibility to states and to localities to expand workforce education in the way they see fit. And I have to say, Governor Reynolds has been a leader in this. She is one of the governors that has participated in the White House initiative on apprenticeships and has been part of the president's task force on initiatives and has been a great partner in helping design these efforts. So Governor, thank you. Thank you very much for that partnership. And finally, I want to talk about a very important area that sometimes is talked about less. And that is what do we do with people in crisis? I was a former prosecutor in South Florida and a former US attorney. And one of the areas that interested me and that I know interests Governor Reynolds is prisoner reentry. What do you do with individuals that have left the system? And as a prosecutor, my view is this. Once someone has completed their sentence, they have done what we ask them to do. And the best thing that we can do for them is to help them find a job. From a national perspective, the best thing we can do for the economy and for the nation is to help them find a job. This is pretty simple. A job where someone contributes to the economy and pays taxes or recidivism and going back to prison. This is a no-brainer. And so very soon we're going to be announcing programs, we're going to be announcing a grant program to seek local ideas and how to support reentry initiatives. Our economy needs individuals to work. They want to work. Too often, licenses or bias 
at the local level bar them from working, and that is wrong. By the same token, the opioid crisis is affecting everyone. You know, in Iowa, there were more than 270 million opioid pills dispensed in one year. That's 90 pills for every man, woman, or child in your state. How is that possible? There's something really wrong when you have numbers of that magnitude. And it's having a deep impact. There was a study done by the Department of Labor's Bureau of Labor Statistics, the same folks that measure the unemployment rate, that asked a very simple question. Of the adult males that were not in the labor force, did you take a painkiller yesterday? 44% said yes. Was it a prescription painkiller? 31% said yes. Now, some individuals need it, and it is medically appropriate. But for far too many individuals, these are dispensed, and individuals get hooked. And we need to work to reverse this. Because it doesn't just impact those individuals, but it also impacts our economy and our labor force. Because these are individuals that are at a productive point in their life, that have great skills, but that realistically have a problem and are in crisis and can't work. And that is why the president is so focused on this issue. And just a little over a week ago in Ohio, we announced a grant program to also reintegrate those individuals into the workforce. And here's why. I visited Mary Haven, which is a great hospital to treat individuals with addiction. But once they were treated, they were released, and there was no connection between them and the workforce. Same thing that happens with prisoner reentry. What is one of the best things that we can do for individuals that have an addiction? Say, if you get cleaned, if you address this, you're going to have a job. So doesn't it make sense to have job counseling in these addiction centers? And doesn't it make sense to connect individuals that are in crisis to the job which, so that they understand that when they finish and they go to work, they have a career path and a future. And so, in my job over the past year, I've had the privilege and the pleasure of meeting a lot of individuals, from the young man that I met today, who told me that he was now at Indian Hills, even though he'd been homeless, to the other students each of whom shared their stories, to individuals like them all around the nation. And one thing that struck me is that whether in Iowa or Florida, everyone has pretty similar basic questions. The factory worker wants to know, will I keep my job? The entrepreneur, can I start my own business? The business person, how can I find more customers? And I think if as a nation we focus on these real, basic, elemental questions, Americans are going to thrive. And one thing that I will say that I think is very clear is that President Trump is focused on this economy and is focused on helping all Americans answer those simple questions. Unemployment rate is at a 17-year low and an 18-year low here in Iowa. Goods-producing industries such as manufacturing achieved their biggest gain in 20 years last month. Small business optimism is at an all-time high. And you're seeing employers creating jobs all across this nation. And importantly, you're now seeing wages rise. And that wage rise is really important because it hasn't happened in a long, long time. And the way we're going to continue that is by providing all of you the flexibility to do what is right here in Iowa, 
and to provide all Americans the flexibility to do what is right in their home states. Because every state is different. And so we are here to basically say, we're not here to help you, but we're here to support you. And that is a very important distinction. We're here to support your efforts to do what is right for your state. And we look forward to helping your governor help Iowa in a supportive role. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.